everybody. Welcome back to Corona Chat. It's Caitlin, and today is Thursday, July 9th. Um, and, you know, if your social media feed looks anything like ours right now, you maybe see a lot of arguing back and forth about the U.S. COVID numbers and what they mean, right? So some people are saying that the numbers are going up because we're doing more testing, and some people say that the fact that we're the testing is showing more positives means that the virus isn't that bad. And some people are saying, like, those people are totally wrong, but they're not really able to articulate why. So what's really going on? In tonight's video, we're gonna take a deep dive into the numbers and try to help you make sense of some of these different statistics that people are throwing around and how to make sense of them. So let's get started. All across the country, states have ramped up testing. It's still pretty tough to get a test, right? In most places, you need to have symptoms and you have to have been exposed to someone who has a confirmed case of COVID-19. And this will be important in a minute. Um, but state and local health departments are trying to do their best to get at least people who might have been exposed tested. And this is a huge improvement from just a few months ago, where we were only testing people who were really sick and showing up at the hospital. The fact that we're now able to test and diagnose people before they know they're sick is really good because it means that we can start to do contract tracing and quarantine people who have been exposed so that they don't infect anyone else. And since the pandemic is still actively spreading, we expect that as we test more people, we're going to see more cases. So that piece of this whole thing is true. Um, but the total number of people who test positive actually doesn't tell us very much. It's an easy thing to count, but it's not a particularly useful number. What we're more interested in is something called the positivity rate, which is the number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests. After all, 100 positive tests when you've tested a million people is really different than 100 positive tests when you've only tested 100 people. So the other thing that we're interested in with that positivity rate isn't technically part of the number itself, but it, it has to do with who you're testing. So if you're only testing people who are already in the hospital with COVID-like symptoms, you would expect to see a much higher positivity rate than if you're testing otherwise healthy people in the community, right? It would it makes sense. You would expect to see more of those seemingly healthy people actually be healthy than the seemingly COVID people. You'd expect to see a higher rate of positivity among the COVID patients, the, the people who were sick with COVID symptoms in the hospital, right? So there's a fair amount of discussion among infectious disease experts and public health officials that if the positivity rates are really high, it means we're not testing enough people to actually get ahead of the virus's spread and contain the pandemic, right? Um, we're only testing the people who are the sickest. We're only testing the people who are actually infected, not everybody who might have been exposed. Of course, the flip side is that you could be testing everybody, but the virus is everywhere. Um, and it can be hard to know the difference if you can only see the positivity rate, but you don't know who was allowed to get tested. So this is why it's important that we keep in mind that in most parts of the U.S., you can only get tested if there's a good chance that you have coronavirus. So we should expect the testing rates, the positivity rates of those tests to be fairly high. Um, but until we have more widespread testing, we won't be able to know just how much the virus is spreading. So, okay, more people are testing positive, but those people don't have symptoms and it's not like deaths have skyrocketed. So doesn't that mean everyone's just overreacting and actually this thing isn't that bad? Not exactly. Remember, we're testing people when they still have mild symptoms and sometimes we're testing people before they start feeling sick at all. We just know that they were exposed. And this doesn't mean that those people are not going to get really sick. It just means that we've diagnosed them earlier in the course of the illness. We still don't have any cure or treatment that will prevent them from getting really sick. It's all just luck of the draw at this point. The clinical progression of severe COVID-19 is that someone gets infected and continues to feel fine for several days while they're potentially infecting other people. Then they start to develop a cough, maybe some diarrhea and vomiting, maybe some body aches, but this could be anything, right? After a few more days, that cough gets really nasty. Maybe they have a high fever and maybe they start having a hard time breathing, so they go to the hospital. And at this point, it's already been a week or two since they could have tested positive if there were wide-scale testing available. Now, once they're in the hospital, the medical team gives this person antibiotics to prevent them from getting bacterial pneumonia on top of everything else and tries to give them you know, some experimental treatments that might help. If none of that works, they might get put on a ventilator. Ultimately, some of those people on ventilators recover and go home, and others die. But that whole process takes weeks on average. What this means is that hospitalization numbers and deaths move more slowly than testing numbers. 
we can think of them kind of as, as slow-mo versions of one another, right? So if we had perfect data from wide-scale testing, which we don't, but if we had it, what we would expect to see is that if the percent of positive tests started to go up, hospitalizations would start to go up at the same rate, meaning they'd be parallel lines on a graph, um, but not until a couple of weeks later, right? Um, deaths, the same thing, right? An another line, same kind of parallel trend, but not until a couple of weeks later after the hospitalizations. And since the testing data that we have is kind of funky right now, we really have to try to look at testing against, really testing, right, against hospitalizations and deaths, right? Um, and we can't just look at the numbers from a single day. We have to try to look at these trends over time. And by looking at these trends together, we can get a clearer picture of what's going on. Right? These numbers will also help us get a sense of when the pandemic is finally starting to slow down. So just seeing testing numbers decrease doesn't tell us enough on its own, right? It could be that people aren't getting infected, but it could also be that we're testing the wrong people or that we're not doing enough testing or have stopped testing entirely, right? None of that means that the pandemic is over. But if we know that we're doing good wide-scale testing, the percent positive rate keeps dropping in our testing numbers, um, and the numbers of hospitalizations and deaths also start to come down, right? So we're seeing a few weeks behind um, but our, our parallel trend lines, right, coming down, it's fair to start thinking that we have turned the corner. So takeaway from this week, don't just look at the number of positive tests. You want positivity rates, an idea of how testing is being done, the number of people hospitalized, and the number of deaths. And you want to look at these things over time. Lots of state departments of health have updated dashboards online with all of this information that you can view as a member of the public. And now you know how to parse these numbers. So Hopefully this video has been helpful. As always, drop your comments and questions in the notes. We'd love to hear from you. Stay safe out there. Take care of one another. And remember, we're all in this together. We'll talk to you next week.